Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. What do you mean there's extraterrestrials in the trees? All the trees are infected. What do you what do you what do you mean the trees are infected? Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show. On a Monday, we're early at 8 o'clock, yet we have dropped a host. Andrew cannot be with us on this week's show because it's personal reasons, so I've reeled somebody in. I've coerced him into joining me this week and it will be confusing to a lot of people because he's also called Stuart. It's confusing to me as well, actually. This feels like some sort of weird role reversal. So, yeah. Coerced, you just asked. You went, yeah. would you like to do it? And I went, all right, I'm... Well, I could have offered you some jelly babies or something like that. I don't know if that would have made the the deal a bit more sweeter. Oh, do you mean if I held out, I could have got some jelly babies? You no. could have gotten some jelly babies. But you, right, you didn't. You were, yeah, you were easily coerced, like I said, into joining me on this week's show. Because, yeah, without somebody beside my side, it would have just been me waffling on for 60 minutes. And I don't think people want to hear that. No, they they had that a few weeks ago, and I don't think it's right to do it twice in the same year. Yeah, I know. It it hurt my voice, it hurt my ears, and I'm guessing it hurts a lot of people's ears when they listen to me waffle on for 45 minutes. So, yeah, that, that, that thank God that's not going to happen this week. Um, you can get us in the live chat in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. There's a little symbol there. Just click on that and send us messages. Please, no abusive ones. I'm not in the mood for that kind of thing. Uh, make sure you vi- visit the website mondaymovieshow.co.uk and Stuart do you want to plug your side? Uh, I am from page to screen that's the number two not the word two and just stick that into Google it'll take you to all the different websites and all the different podcasts and all the different social media accounts you yeah go. you update yours much more often than the Monday Movie Show website gets updated because I think I'm alone in that site because I update it myself nothing else I, I do mine myself if it's any consolation, <laughs> I just live in front of the keyboard. Show off. Yeah, I got a job. Until I was going to say, you, you, <laughs> so... that was going to be my uh, defense for you. You actually have a job away from the keyboard. Yeah, so I, I wish I could sit in front of the keyboard and type up a lot of things. Like, maybe I should hire multiple monkeys to try and type it up. But, yeah, that thesis has gone out the window because monkeys can't type up Shakespeare and stuff. We're here to actually review films, not the waffle on. We do waffling on brilliantly, but films is what we're here to actually have a look at. And in the cinema section, there's only two films that we're looking at this week, and they are. We have got well, we got Big Game, the Samuel Jackson one. I've seen written on the side of buses and a few trailers dotted around. And the other one, I believe, is The Canal, which, to be honest, I've never heard of. Yeah, it's an Irish slash British horror film. So, so I, sh- it's, I should it's have nice heard that. Yeah, it's nice to shoehorn that in. Yeah, we were supposed to add a couple of more films, including Spooks, uh, The Greater Good, but one, I've never seen a single episode of Spooks, so I probably would be the worst person to review that film, and two, Andrew was supposed to have reviewed it. So I can't review well, it. I've seen, a lot of, I've seen a lot of episodes of Spooks. The TV show is really good, and I'm looking forward to watching a film, but I've not seen it yet, so I can't review it either. Yeah, and on Blu-ray and DVD, we're looking at these films. Yeah, what have we got on Blu-ray? Oh, look, there's a lovely little scrolly bunny. I've got a theory of everything. There is uh, Wormwood, Playing It Cool, and We Are Monster. Yeah, which um, you've seen a couple of those ones, haven't you? So, I have. Including one that you're going to review solely on your own, which is the first time you've done this. I think you've done the show three times with me, and this will be the first time that you're solely in charge of a review. Yeah, so anybody out there listening to this show, I am actually going to review without ripping it to pieces. So that'll be a bit of a novelty for you. So I and hope I'm you enjoy it. I'm going to just do my brilliant self and review it the way I like to review films. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But let's kick things off with some movie news. Now, I don't know if you've gotten any movie news jotted down. Um, no, I did a bunch of horror news last night, but I've not seen any actual movie news today. So I'm going to sit down and listen to your movie news. Yeah, so uh, movie news-wise, I'll kick off with uh, the 2012 reboot of The Three Stooges is unfortunately getting a sequel. However, the Farley brothers will not return to direct it. Yay. 
Oh, I don't know if that's a yay or, or whatever. Consider. Have you seen the uh, the Three Stooges, the twenty twelve version of it? Has anybody seen the twenty twelve reboot of the Three Stooges? <laughs> that yeah, would I be have. my question. Is it as bad as it probably looks? I reviewed it, and it's not. It could have been when when you watch the film. It, it's very moronic. It's very annoying from the trailer. There is one joke which actually made me giggle. Surprisingly, the film itself is really bad. But it, it did make me giggle. But it doesn't warrant a sequel. No. But it, does it anything just, nowadays? There's so many that don't warrant sequels or remakes. I I don't even know that um, if uh, the Three Stooges, the 2012 one, did very well at the box office to warrant oh, a sequel. No. So it, it just makes your head scratch a little bit when a movie gets a sequel that didn't do very well at the box office, yet we're crying out for things like Dread 2, which deserves a sequel and it's never ever going to get one because it just got it just got shoehorned into very few cinemas and people were mourning about it, yet these are the people who want the sequel. It's, you can't appease everybody, <laughs> but when you try to, you still can't appease them. Nope. It's annoying. The movie-going public <laughs> is very gullible and annoying. I'd so, other than us, of course. Other yeah. than us. Yeah. Um, Marvel News. No surprise, there's Marvel News every single week. But Marvel have announced that Paul Rudd's Ant-Man will be making an appearance in Captain America Civil War. Paul Bettany's vision from Avengers Age of Ultron will also appear in the film, along with Robert Downey Jr., who played Iron Man, Chris Evans, who played Captain America, Scarlett Johansson, Jeremy Renner, Don Cheadle, and Elizabeth Olsen. So in other words, the entirety of the cast from Avengers Age of Ultron will be in um, the next Captain America film. So it's pretty much another Avengers film then, rather than a Captain America film. Yeah, and then you've got uh, the the first part of um, the Avengers double bill to come as well. So uh, wow. is it me? I've, I've, I've hit overload with, comic, with all this shared universe stuff. I've yeah, officially that... hit overload. That was going to be my question. Is it me, or do you think that Marvel might have lost the plot a little bit? Considering uh, that a lot of people, a lot of people seem to be berating DC about how they seem to be handling their universes and not handling them very well. It seems that since Disney bought Marvel, um, the movie rights anyway, that it seems to be overload of just nothing but the same thing over and over again. But until they stop making money, then they're going to keep doing it. It's yeah, which... crazy, but as a fan, I've definitely hit overload now. Yeah, we'll, we'll get on to Avengers um, Age of Ultron when we get to the box office top 10, but I just think they've hit saturation too much. They're, they're milking it so bad that we didn't need to see practically the entire cast of Avengers Age of Ultron in Captain America Civil War. It's a Captain America film. It's not... Uh, Iron Man film. It's not um, a, just any kind of character film. It all centers around Captain America. It's the same with the, the Man of Steel follow up, though, isn't it? That at one point was going to be a Superman 2, and then now it's somehow become a pre Justice League thing. Yeah, the, the different story is that uh, with, the, with uh, the next Batman vs. Superman film, it, it's sort of like DC just starting. If you need to put it alongside something, it's it's more alongside the first Avengers film because this is just DC starting their universe. With Marvel, they've had the universe going for a good ten years now, so it's sort of like understandable on that front. But Marvel should we should be used to the characters by now. We don't need to see them shoehorned into every single film. Nope. But yeah, they're gonna do it. It's it's crazy. The salary bill must be massive on these films now. Yeah, the, I, th I wouldn't be surprised if the salary is more than the budget of the film. So uh, you've got like two hundred and fifty million dollars for the budget. You've got two hundred and fifty million dollars for the salary, and then you've got another four or five hundred million dollars for um, advertising and stuff like that. It's a billion dollars even before you actually release the film and then you need to make it uh, a billion before you start getting profit exactly it's which crazy easy to get past can we, that can we just have little indie movies just taking over the cinemas now i'd be okay with that that's not going to happen though no. no it's not um other news is according to the rap beverly hills cop 4 is being put on indefinite hold yay exactly yay do we need to see a beverly hills cop 4 
Exactly. No more <laughs> needs to be said about that news there. Um, in an interview with Vanity Fair, J.J. Abrams plans to kill off Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars The Force Awakens. Yeah, it won't happen. I don't think, I think that's a joke. Um, I can't see him putting Jar Jar Binks in a film set 30 years after Return of the Jedi that had zero mention of Jar Jar Binks through any of the original trilogy. So I think he's just winding somebody up there. I hope sort of like they completely forgot about Jar Jar Binks and then all of a sudden he pops up and just Han Solo pulls out a gun and shoots him. <laughs> yeah, well, you look, like... But you look who is left from the, the Star Wars Empire Jedi trilogy that would have met Jar Jar Binks. There's only yeah. like 3PO and R2. Everybody else is gone. Well, they still could shoehorn him in there somewhere and I'm just getting crushed by uh, um, the Millennium Falcon or something like that. It's just landing on a planet and Jar Jar Binks comes running out and it just crushes him. Or, or something Stick. silly like that. Just put Jar Jar in the Avengers. Just be done with it. It's all Disney product now. So. Isn't it? No thanks, because if that's the case, we'll start seeing C-3PO and R2-D2 and Chewbacca and all them Yoda just yeah. in the next um, the Avengers Phase 5 or something. Um, yeah, and final piece... It. Final piece of news that I've got, it's a Lucas one, but Lucasfilm's Kathleen Kennedy has revealed that a new Indiana Jones film is in development. However, she did say that there will be a bit of a wait for it. Yeah, what do you reckon? Seven years? I reckon seven years before that film sees the light of day. Yeah, I, I, seven years might be a bit long. Long to wait. They've, so. they've not even started a script. So you're talking at least two years before the script's done, Production will be at least 12 months. You've got a bit of casting and, uh, yeah, maybe maybe six. But you, you are not going to see this film this side of 2020. I, I think, though, if they want to get Chris Pratt, who is the rumoured person, to take over Harrison Ford, if they want to get him to play uh, Indiana Jones in the film, they're going to have to speedball the movie much more quicker than five, six years because yeah. I don't think he's going to be interested in it because... There was a recent interview with him and his wife, Anna Faris, um, where he said that he doesn't know when it's going to happen, but eventually he just wants to quit the entirety of the movie business, make enough money so his family can live very well, and then just quit. And wow. so in five, six years' time, he might have had enough of doing these constant big films and just say, oh, that's it, I'm done. So they'll have lost the properties, the actor who they wanted to play uh, Indiana Jones, because he does look a lot like Harrison Ford, a younger he, version of Harrison Ford. He does. I still want Bradley Cooper to play. Think Bradley Cooper, he could do Indiana Jones. I, I think, again, Bradley Cooper might be just too old but in six years' time to play Indiana Jones. I know that they've got uh, Harrison Ford at a, an old age to do that, but I think they'll, want, they'll need to go in a different direction and they won't want to start off a new Indiana Jones series with an actor who's in his mid-50s. By then, as long, so. as long as it's not Shia LaBeouf, I'll be happy. Yeah, as long as he's definitely not in the movie, everybody will be happy. <laughs> exactly. And as long as it exactly. doesn't feature aliens. Oh, yeah. Or a, a fridge that can actually protect you from a nuclear blast. Oh, I was okay with the fridge part, but it was just the aliens, really. Just, you, didn't, you could allude to aliens, but don't show them. You don't need to show them. Yeah, well, the the problem is when you do have uh, the fridge and the nuclear blast happen in the first 10 minutes, you know you're in for just an absolute hell of a ride here. Because it, it's just, that could not happen. That that fridge has got to be the most protect, protective thing ever created for that to protect Indiana Jones from having seven limbs. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's just ridiculous. Um, UK box office top 10. We have a number 10, Child 44. Which um, I've not seen. Um, Andrew is the one who's seen the film. He thought it was a bit lacking. He thought um, it takes around 50 minutes to get going. And then after that, it's not very much of a get going. Uh, Tom Hardy, Numi Rapace, they're very underused in the movie. I mean, the cast list phenomenal. Gary Oldman, you can add to that. Joseph Alton, who I'm familiar with, he's in it as well. Just remember, it is based on a book, and books are generally a little bit slow. So. Yeah, but a two and a half hour film where it takes around a bit an hour to get started is not a good way to actually entertain your audience. Very true. I'll probably catch that one on Blu-ray or DVD or whatever when it uh, when it surfaces. I number nine, 
We have Woman in Gold, a film, a film I am not familiar with. So, Woman in Gold, what's that about, Steve? Ryan Reynolds, Helen Mirren. It's about um, art that went missing and Helen Mirren needn't help from Ryan Reynolds' character to try and find it. Uh, that, that's as simple as that. Again, it's another film that Andrew was seen over me. So it would have been nicer if he was here tonight so then you could actually comment on them. But yeah, he said it was average. Decent enough acting from both Helen Mirren and Ryan Reynolds, which we expect that from Helen Mirren. She's a fantastic actress, no matter what she's in. Surprising from Ryan Reynolds, but yeah, he says the film is, itself is, is quite average. At number eight, we have a film that I'm pretty sure Andy's seen several times. SpongeBob movie, Sponge Out of Water. Actually, it's the way around. I'm the one who's seen this film and he hasn't seen it. So it's, yeah, um, it's if you're a fan of the TV show... Um, you'll enjoy the first 70 minutes after that it just goes into the stupid territory where it needs live action stuff and it doesn't need live action stuff because that's the part that doesn't work okay number seven two by two another film i'm not familiar with animated film called uh, two by two oops the arc is gone which is just i know i've not put the full title there but i couldn't put myself to actually put the full title down um uh, it's one of those animated films where it's funded by like five different countries and you know you've got a slight problem when that's, that happens. It's one of those ones which should have gone direct to DVD because it just has no no place in the cinema. Ouch. Let's see if we fare better with number six, the live action vers- version of Cinderella. Which um, I've said this week in, week out, and I'm sticking by um, Cinderella. I just felt like it was a bit of a lazy retelling of the brilliant animated version of the film we've seen loads of different films which take the story of cinderella and do their own take on it but what kenneth branner has done with this one is just practically live action shot it for shot with the animated version of it lily james is pretty decent as cinderella she's got that kind of look to it and kate blanchett steals the show as um the evil stepmother because she's sort of like got that 1940s look to her and she she's brilliant at that as well. Rob Brydon even crops up in the movie as a, in a tiny tiny little role and has a very uncomfortable um, joke, so which doesn't work. And that that's for me that's the crux of the film. It just didn't work. It was just too lazy for me. And Rob Rob Brydon he is going to pop up as one of the dwarfs in the Huntsman sequel, I believe. Woohoo! And, exactly. Number five, another animated one. You can tell it's been half term. Home. Yeah, which I've seen this twice. Um, a lot of critics give it a bit of a panning. It, it's not DreamWorks' best film. Um, there's loads of other films from DreamWorks, which is much better than this, including How to Train Your Dragon 2 and the Shrek series up to the third one after that, then pass. Uh, but yeah, it, it's okay. Decent enough animation. At times, it's a bit lacking. The voices are fine. Jim Parsons, who plays the voice of O in the movie, you have to get used to him being an animated character because his voice is very much like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. So if, like me, you're a huge Big Bang Theory fan, then uh, it's really off-putting for the first 20 minutes. But you do get used to it. It's just his character is quite annoying. At number four, we have one last ride for the entire crew of Fast and the Furious. Number seventh in this franchise. That's a film I've seen. We've spoke about it before. I loved it. It's mad as a bag of cats. It's like James Bond times 10. What did you think of Fast and the Furious 7, Stu? Um... It's not the best in the series. It's a good send-off um, in a way, and maybe it's to try and do something different with the eighth film. Because if you look at it, the rebooted one, um, the fifth one in the series, fourth, Fast and Furious. Yeah, Fast and Furious is the fourth, and then the fifth and sixth. So the way I see it is Fast and Furious was sort of like a reboot to get it back into its wheels again, no pun intended there. And then um, five, six, and seven are sort of like a trilogy, if you look at the, the way the film is handled, it, it feels more like a trilogy of films. It's it's messy because there's too many characters to try and uh, follow along. And so James Wan has a trouble of doing that. He gets it together properly in the last 45 minutes of it with one huge massive set piece. And he's able to hand that well. So that, that gives him it, it gives him a push in the future because he's normally a horror director, James Wan. And so as an action film, he's out of his comfort zone. So he did a good job of it. It's not the best in the series, though. No, that would be number three, Tokyo Drift. Just kidding. Right, number three, we have a film that we've spoke about on at least three or four different podcasts this week, it seems. The uh, very creepy Unfriended. 
Yeah, it's a new entry for Unfriended. Um, I got angry on the horror show. You need to listen to that when when the podcast goes up. I don't know if it's up yet, is it? Sure is. Yep. It is. So, yep, search for From Page to Scream, and you can listen to my uncensored rant about the problems I had with Unfriended. Not with the film. It was with the screening of it um, and the people who were actually watching it. Um, that, that didn't stop me from quite liking the film because I did like it. It's an interesting take on a horror film, especially with it being a low-budget movie with only a million-dollar budget. It's took that in its UK alone. So it's brought its budget back just in this country alone in its first weekend. So it surpassed it easily in America by 20 times. It And I like the premise of it. It's got a few creepy moments. There is one moment in the film which will make you gasp. It will shock you. And the only part of the film which shut everybody up in the screen and that he went to see. Because it, 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 they did not expect it. It's a scene that you will definitely not expect. And I love when horror does that. Something that takes takes you back a little bit, reels you back a little bit, and you don't expect it. There is a perfect scene in the film for that. And it's shocking. It is really a shocking scene. Is it a Jar Jar Binks cameo? No. Right, okay. Well, that rules that one out then. There we go. Number two, we have Remake Time. It is Far From The Madding Crowd. Yeah, it, it's a film... I'm sick of these remakes. We People know what we think of remakes. Um, we're just sick of it. I can understand why they decided to release the version of Far From the Running Crowd now because we've seen a lot of movies sort of like set in this period released this year, including one that's coming up in a few weeks' time called Testament of Youth, which I highly recommend with uh, Alicia Vikander in it. Um, this is just a like-for-like -like remake. So if you know the story of Far From the Running Crowd and you want to see a more up-to-date version of it, I'm not as angry with this film as I am with Cinderella. Because it, it, it feels like the enough has been changed with the film to make it feel like it's a different telling of the story rather than feeling like it's the same telling of a story which was seen done multiple times before. And at number one, we have this little indie film called... Ooh, what is that called? Oh, yes. Avengers Age of Ultron. Not heard of that one. Should yeah. have advertised it. Stupid amounts of money. 32 million so far at the UK box office. Uh, the new box offices will be out on Wednesday, so it should easily serve past 35 million, which is where uh, 34 million is where uh, 50 Shades of Grey sits at, and um, 36 million is where Fast and Furious 7 sits at. Both of them movies should easily smash past the 40 million mark. Um, it, it's done insane for itself, Avengers Age of Ultron, very close to a billion. It has not beaten Fast and Furious 7. For the for the past the billion dollar mark that took seventeen days. It's not done that, so it'll not break that record there. But it has took a lot of money. It's a messy film from Joss Whedon, and you can tell that it's Joss Whedon's final swan song when it comes to the Avengers series. He, he's take, he's stepping back now because he's not directing the next two one. That's the Russo brothers. Um, at times the film is entertaining enough. It's just too frantic and too messy to be entertain uh, properly entertaining. Well, here's hoping the much rumored three and a half hour cut does actually make the uh, the light of day. Yeah, because it's supposed to actually return a few characters into the film and a few scenes that uh, make the film more uh, to make more sense rather than it just being all about the set pieces and how much you could cram into it. So uh, let's hope. I really hope it's not three and a half hours long though. No, apparently his original cut was three and a half hours, and that's supposedly, according to rumour, one of the reasons that there was a bit of a falling out between Whedon and Marvel. So, but who uh, knows? Could you sit through an Avengers film that's three and a half hours long? I could at home, because I would just watch it in two lumps, but I couldn't at the cinema. Forget it. Not happening. Yeah, it, it just I, I could barely sit through where the final Lord of the Rings film, and that was very close to four hours, so... Oh, my bottom would be majorly sore if I if I had to actually sit through his original three and a half hour cut when I went to see it at the cinema. I saw the first film before that, so you know, just imagine how I felt. And compared to Mark from Following the Nerd, which is a show I do on a Thursday night, um, he sat through 20 hours of it because he went to see a Marvel movie marathon. Oh, I couldn't do it. Couldn't sit through that many hours of Marvel movies. No. Nope. 20 hours is just Not way too much for me. 20 yep. hours is way too much for me in a week to watch Marvel films, never mind in one day. I've watched the original Star Wars trilogy in the cinema on a marathon thing twice in a row. So I was in there for 12 hours. 
Um, but I couldn't do any more than that. Just I've like, never done it. I've never sat down and watched like um, more than two films in a cinema back to back. Wow, I, that I could just, be some I, homework for this year for you. Yeah, that, that's not going to happen. But I, I've never ever <laughs> done. I've no intention to do it. I've been tempted by these horror movie marathons that my cinema show over Halloween, but I just think to myself. It's a bit of a waste of our money, and by the time we come out of it, I'm going to be knackered. I'm going to hate myself for going to see like five horror films in a row. Just wait about three or four years, and you can watch all the Fifty Shades movies as they're meant to be seen as a trilogy. As a matter of fact, last week I was supposed to review uh, the, re- or is it this week? No, it's this week. Um, Andrew was trying to tempt me to sit down and watch uh, *Nymphomaniac* parts one and two because it's being released in its own cut form. When we saw how long it's on for, just shy of six hours. Yeah, I passed. Yeah, I was. I I, pass. I've not yet seen *Nymphomaniac*, but a Lars von Trier film at two hours stretches my patience. At six hours, then it's just pushing me way too over the edge. <laughs> and right. then watch it again with commentary. So yeah. No oh, God, enough, no. Enough about that. No thanks. Um, new releases of the week. First up is *Big Game*. It's directed by Halmia Helander. Now, uh, Almir Landa did a film which I love called Rare Exports. Um, I love that movie. It's a Christmas movie, sort of like giving you a different retelling of the Santa Claus story. And it's very dark, very twisted, with some interesting, funny humour in there. And in this one, what he's decided to do is sort of like take the hijacking kind of genre and do what he did with uh, Rare Exports. And he's got Samuel Jackson to play the president, so this is his first English language speaking film. And um, he's on Air Force One um, getting ready to go to a, a special conference when the plane itself is shot down by uh, ground to air missiles. Um, the plane crashes itself and he discovers this boy who's uh, played by Oni Tamilia, who was in Red Exploits. He plays uh, Oscari. And now Oscari has been sent into the woods by his father as a rite of passage where he has to spend 24 hours to fend for himself and come back with a trophy, whether it be um, in the, his father's case, a bear, or in his case, at most, a deer's head. And so Oscari needs to team up with the president to uh, try and help him against these people who want the president dead. Now, that's the simplest way of putting it. As a matter of fact, they want the president as a trophy. Here's a clip giving you a feel of what the film's like. President, you okay? Oh, how the hell did I survive that? And where are my soldiers? I'm the commander of the biggest, baddest, ass-kicking armed force on the planet. Why aren't they scouting this wilderness trying to rescue me? There's no one to help us. Not my dad, or not your army. We have to help ourselves. Instead of looking tough, we have to be tough. Right. So that clip there gives you the tone of the film. Unfortunately, you can't hear the clip, can you? No. So you you don't have a feel of what the tone is, but um, while the the clip was playing and the microphones were muted, I was saying something to Stuart about giving them the kind of feel of what uh, the film is like. And so from what I told you, how would you grasp the film? What what kind of tone do you think the film has? Kind of bonkers. Um... 
yeah, the sort of film that makes you wonder how somebody got paid to write that, but fair play to them for getting a big fat check for that screenplay. Yeah, um, Halmari Halanda was the one who wrote it, so he directed and wrote it. So he yeah. he did exactly the same with Red Exports, and that that's the biggest problem with uh, Big Game. It's, it's torn. It just hasn't a clue what kind of film it wants to be, whether it wants to be serious, and at times it is serious, or whether it wants to be kooky and quirky and uh, comedic, which at times it tries to do that, it fails to actually meld them together, which it wants, that's what it wants to do. He does that very well with Rare Exports. With this one, it just doesn't work because he, he has said that he wants to make it feel like it's like Cliffhanger meets a Steven Spielberg movie. Okay. But, yeah, which it, it does make you scratch and say, uh, okay, mm-hmm. how, how can you meld those two together? Aunt. Exactly, you can't and you shouldn't try to attempt to do that because they're not. It's a marriage made in hell, not in heaven. Um, Samuel Jackson is on uber cheese form as the president. He's just constantly through the film. Do you know who I am? Is the question he asks a lot. Yeah, we do know you who you are. You're the president. You keep telling us that. We don't care. Um, Oscari is sort of like tries to keep the film grounded, the character of Ascari, because he is just there as a rite of passage to try and become a man. He's 13, his character's 13 in the film. And that's what they must do when every single boy turns 13 in, in the village that he lives. He has to go out in the wild for 24 hours and fend for himself and come back with a trophy. And that's sort of like, fine, the story there. But when you reel it in with hunters trying to hunt down the president for a nefarious reason, and then the cherry on top of the cake, you throw Jim Broadbent and Felicity Hoffman into the mix as well, who work um, back in America trying to figure out how to rescue the president with Jim Broadbent obsessed with eating a sandwich. He, he takes, I thought I was took ages eating a sandwich. He takes the entirety of the movie to eat one. Just a standard lettuce and ham sandwich. It takes him 90 minutes to eat the san- one sandwich. Ninety minutes. So it's not even like a huge sandwich. Not like a no. big game sandwich. No. Nope. Two slices of bread, one slice of ham, a bit of lettuce. And I'm probably guessing a tiny little bit of mayonnaise. That's the most interesting thing about the film as well. The sandwich. You look at it and go, ooh, I wonder what he's eating. It's just, <laughs> the, the, yeah, you look at the trailer and you see explosions. There, What you see in the trailer, that that's about as much as the budget can handle. Uh, special effects wise it's just the film itself is bad it is really really bad um, and it's annoying coming from a director who i loved his last film in rare exports it was it showed ingenuity it showed a, a director who wanted to try something different with a, a genre that might be a bit stagnant or the specifically the horror genre back then and try to do something different with uh, a christmas film in this case he should just stick to doing that because he hasn't handled Big Game really well at all. Which is annoying. The other film... Course, that... Yeah, you got the genius idea of releasing Big Game what, like the week after Avengers came out. Uh, yeah. It's not good. It, it's sort yeah. of like smart in a way because it's not released a week where you have big films out. So it, it's sort of like a smart thing to do because alongside that was Spooks the Greater Good... And you know the TV series of that. I don't know it at all. So I don't know the tone of what the Spooks TV series is like. Yeah, Spooks is pretty much just just think a British version of 24. And you've got Spooks. It's very good. Yeah, that, that's what I've heard of. So uh, like I said at the start of the show, we were supposed to be reviewing uh, Spooks the Greater Good. But I've not seen it. And um, I have no interest in seeing it at all. Because I don't know if it is one of those movies where you could watch it alone from the TV series, or you need to know enough about the TV series to get the movie? No, because so... you've got Kit, Kit Harrington's in it, who's from Game of Thrones. He was he had nothing to do with the TV show. Um, it is a standalone film, just set in the same sort of universe as the TV series. So you don't have to have seen the TV show to, uh, to enjoy the movie. Mm, I'm still not interested, to be honest, because the trailer didn't do nothing for me. It just looked a very... Sort of like... Bond meets Bourne kind of thing, and I'm not a Bond fan. I'm a Bourne fan, but not a <clears> Bond fan. I know. Sacrilege. Oh. I might as well mention Did I'm still see? not a fan of uh, the Godfather trilogy or The Exorcist. Ouch. 
kneeling coffin there for me. A lot of movie fans go, why there? Why does he have a movie review show then if he's not a fan of The Exorcist or The Godfather? Exactly what they're thinking. Yeah. Why indeed? All right. Uh, the other cinema review of the week is The Canal. It's a British slash Irish horror film. Um, it's directed by Ivan Kavanagh and it stars Rupert Evans, who plays David. And um, he's having quite a rough time as of late. Um, he thinks that his relationship with his wife is is fine. They've got a kid. Um, however, he discovers that his wife is having an affair. Now, something strange happens. His wife goes missing. The police are called in. They believe that he's the one who's done something to his wife. However, he's keep on seeing that it's the house where they live in that um, has done something to his wife. So he goes to investigate what happened in the house prior and discovers back in the early 20th century, around about 1910, um, that a family was murdered into that in that house. And over periods of time, a ritual has to happen. And so he's digging the surface of trying to find out about the story of the house while the police are trying to investigate the murder that's happened, trying to pin him on the death of his wife or the missing of, of his wife while you're trying to deal with the psyche of um, David's character because he is pretty much going mentally unstable. Throw in a babysitter and throw in a child and throw in a partner who works alongside David, you have a bit of a messy film, to be honest. Because uh, that, that is the problem with the canal. It, it just has too many elements which it's trying to stitch together and trying to be intelligent and feels. It tries to be tense, but because the fact that story is a bit muddled, the tension doesn't work. It has the grimy dirtiness uh, really well, but that I think is down to locations in the UK. Because we, we can do those kind of movies really well. Because I know, Stuart, you're an authority on these kind of British gangster movies. Yep. You know them very well and the way they're actually shot and they've got a lot of grime to them, don't they? They certainly do. Sometimes too much grime, but no, it's definitely grime as one of the main ingredients in these films. Yeah, and you've seen a few British horror films as well where it's shot in like high-rise flats or abandoned houses and things like that. And again, they have a very look to it, a very British feel to it. And yep, that's shouting out to you. Tower Block, and what was that one that you, you really liked? Citadel. Yeah, Citadel, which is um, Kieran yep. Foy, who's directed it, who's doing um, a sequel to a film, which I can't remember now. And Kieran Foy is probably going to kill me for not remembering the name of the film. Oops, as long as it's not Big Game 2. No, it, it's, a, it's a, the original film I really liked, and so I was happy to hear that Kieran Foy is directing um, the sequel. I can't remember, so yeah, if Kieran's listening, please send us a message to remind me what it is. But yeah, um, back to the canal, and... It's just a messy film. It doesn't work on the scare fronts. It doesn't work on the, the tension front as well. The acting is a very, it's a very hit and miss. Um, Rupert Evans, who plays David, he's actually pretty decent in it. And so is Antonio Campbell-Hughes, who plays Claire, David's partner. Everybody else is just just there for their character sakes. Um, it, it's nicely shot, but that's about the nicest thing I can see about the film. It's just quite forgettable. There are many more British horror films out there which deserves to be watched over the canal, which I don't think it's getting a very big release neither. It's one of those films where it's probably going to go direct to DVD a couple of weeks' time, so I would wait for it then, if you're interested in it, to be honest. I so, am, and I shall. Yep. Yeah, which I know you'll probably say, um, have a little watch of it, because you'll want to mention it on the horror show. I shall. Which, yep. Right, we will go to an ad break, which is for... The horror show sets nicely tied in that, isn't it? Well, that's like me and you again, isn't it? Just waffling away about stuff. Yeah, Come horror movies. That. Yeah, and after that, yeah. we will be back with uh, the Blu-ray and DVD section of the show. There was a, a real sense of you were doing something wrong, but that did give it that, that feeling of excitement. When the reveal of the film happens, that's when it just becomes absurd. And the atmosphere and just the sense you get whenever you go into it is undeniable. It, it did absolutely zero for me, which could be for the hype. What we've just discussed there is just scratching the surface on it. Hi, I'm Eric England, the director of Contract, and you're listening to From Page to Screen, the horror show. All right, welcome back. Yep, me again, waffling on more so. Now, we've only got four films to go through. Um, do you want to give a quick mention of what they are? 
Oh, let me flip over to the task. You're making me scroll up and down, aren't you? We've got Siri of Everything, the Eddie Redmayne Oscar winning movie. We've got Wormwood playing it cool and the British really, really sort of powerful sledgehammer movie, uh, We Are Monster. And out of those four films, how many have you seen? I have seen Playing It Cool, and I watched We Are Monster this afternoon. I was trying to watch The Theory of Everything, but I ran out of time. So I'll I was, just try and blag my way through that one. Yeah, I was hoping that would have been one of the ones that you watched, because I was uh, quite interested to hear what you would have thought about the film. But um, evidently, I've seen the film, so I can probably handle that. Uh, we kick things off in the Blu-ray and DVD section of the show with a Blu-ray and DVD so, top 10. Top 10. Number 10, we have the Brad Pitt starring Tank Fest Fury. Now, if you've seen any of these movies, do by all means tell us what you think because I think people are sick of hearing what me and Andrew think of the films in the Blu-ray DVD top 10. Yep. Fury, I thought, was pretty good, but it ain't no allies. So anybody who's got Netflix, check allies out. Um, what did you think of Fury, though, Stu? Um, I thought... See, the problem is I think David Ayer might be one of these one-hit wonder directors because he directed End of Watch, which I really liked. Um, after that, I don't think he's directed a really good film because I hated Sabotage. I just thought it was a terrible, terrible, terrible movie. But you know, we've, we've gone over this a few <laughs> times. Yeah, but uh, Fury, I just think it's a too much of a clean, polished film to be set in that period of time because it tries to be a lot like um, a lot like Band of Brothers in a way. And Band of Brothers is a much more gritty movie. It's It's got its foothold in that, centred around just a small collection of characters and how they cope with what they have to do. It's just, it's very well acted. Shia LaBeouf is actually pretty decent in the film, surprisingly. But it's just wow. the film itself is lacking on any oomph. It needs that grittiness and it's just too clean cut. There are scenes in the movie which reminded me of Star Wars because... You've got red flashing lights and green flashing lights, and it's sort of like the the Empire just battling against each other. It's just a very weird way to do the film. I may get around to watching it at some point. But number nine, I've not seen either. It's either called Automata or Automata. Yeah, Automata. Let's go for that one. Yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, Antonio Banderas starring in a film that tries to be like Blade Runner and fails miserably. Uh, the film is horrible. It is really, really terrible of movie. Um, it, it understands that it doesn't have very much of a budget, but it tries so hard to go past the budget that the designs of the robots are just lacking. Um, that the, you just laugh at them, to be honest. Um, one of them is played by Melanie Griffiths, who she does the voice of a sex robot in the film. So that gives you a clue of get, what kind of film it's like. It's just terrible. <laughs> Number eight, we have the Christopher Nolan, he who can't do any wrong, but sometimes people say he does do wrong. Interstellar, which is what, like 14, 15 hours long, it seems. Yeah. Does that give an indication of what you thought of Interstellar, or have you not seen it? I haven't even watched it yet. To be honest, the three hour things put me off. I really need to be in the mood to watch a film that is three hours. Yeah, um, Interstellar is not one of Christopher Nolan's best films, to be uh, from my opinion there. Uh, um, Andrew doesn't agree with me on this, but I think the father-daughter relationship in the movie isn't handled as well as a lot of people make it out to be. And the last 20 minutes of the film is just badly done. It's not, it doesn't feel like it belongs to Interstellar, it feels like it belongs to a different film. Because it ends, there's a part in the movie where you wish it just ends. And it's sort of like what I've had a problem with uh, films like Gone Girl. David Finch is gone, girl. I think the film should have ended 20, 25 minutes before it does. This is exactly the same. It, 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 it's just Christopher Nolan adding more and more to a movie where it didn't need more and more added to it. Okay. Number seven, we're kind of a cheat because it's the Hobbit trilogy. So it should be like 7.5, 6, and 0.7 or whatever. Hobbit 1, meh. Hobbit 2, Better than the first one. I haven't even bothered watching the third one yet. And I'm a massive fan of Lord of the Rings. So that shows you how little I think of the Hobbit movies. Too much CGI. It's a bit like playing a video game. I'll get on to my thoughts on the, the, the third and the final part of the Hobbit trilogy. And a little bit further into the, the top ten. But for me, if I had to go noise-wise. The first Hobbit. Okay, fine. Second Hobbit. Second part of the Hobbit. Ugh, this is getting tedious. The third part, you'll find out in a couple of minutes. 
Well, let's find out what you thought of Paddington because that's at number six. I loved it. It's an old-fashioned family film. It is one of those feel-good, lovely family movies where um, if it's cold outside or you want to watch something with the, your family um, of all the ages, they will find something with the movie because younger kids will love the creation of Paddington, love his mannerisms. Um, teenagers will love the family connection. Uh, the, the adults will love the way the parents handle the film and also specifically the older characters in the movie. And so it's a perfect family film. What about Annie? Is that the perfect family film as well? Because I remember watching the original version at the cinema, I believe it or not, when probably it was about nine or ten. So how does this remake fare up? Yeah, in the first film, Annie had a hard knock life. In this one, Annie had a majorly hard knock, a hard knock life because uh, it, it the, the remake hasn't handled itself well at all. It You know, when during sort of like the early part of the, the 21st century, when we got films like... The, well, late into the 20th century where we've got Scream, and then we've got movies which were referred to as the MTV generation. Yep. Kind of films. Well, we thought that that went away. Yeah, no. They're back with things like Annie because it just feels like it's for the kind of kids who still watch music videos, who watch music channels, because it, it just, it's lacking in any depth, in any heart, in any nuance, in any brilliance from Annie because Annie was wasn't just about the relationship between Annie and um, the rest of the characters. It was also about the songs as well and how you latched yourself onto them. In this one, none of them have got heart at all. Quen Quenzia Wallace, who plays Annie, she was brilliant in Beasts of the Southern, Southern Wild. She's not very good in this one at all. Cameron Diaz, who plays, uh, is in the movie as well. <laughs> Bad casting. Yeah, she's like the yeah, she's like the orf she's like the orphanage boss or something, isn't she? It's yeah, she is. It's bad casting. Ouch. Uh, number four, we have the film Unbroken, which is uh, one of the films that got Jack O'Connell his Rising Star Award at last year's BAFTAs. What's your thoughts on Unbroken? I haven't seen it yet, but I'm really looking forward to watching it. But it looks a bit grim and gritty, so I've got to be in the mood for that one. Yeah, um, the thing with Unbroken is, out of the three films that Jack O'Connell got um, plotted for in 2014, Unbroken, 71, and Startup, Startup was the best one. Um, I think this is his worst one out of the three. 71, even though I don't think it deserves the amount of recognition that it got, it was still a good film. This one, it just... I understand Angelina Jolie, she's done one other film prior to this. And so this is not like a directorial debut. And she's sort of like finding her feet in, or finding her foothold when it comes to what kind of genre she'll be able to ta uh, tackle. In this one, I think she's out of her depth because the uh, the part in the, the, the camps where his character is, is just lacking in any tension. Even though you supposedly got some there about the, the bad mistreatment of his character and the rest of the people in the camp, I felt like the story about him becoming the, the fastest runner on the planet and then ultimately being involved in a plane crash, which it just has him and two other members of that plane stranded at sea. That's the interesting part of the film. It's the part where he is thrown into the camps which is the part which lacks any depth for me. It, it lacks any tension. There are a couple of scenes where it has it, but I just think she concentrates too much on that when there could have been a much better story told from the first, I would say, 25, 30 minutes of the film. Okay. At so number three, we have Birdman or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, to give it its really, really long, weird title. Awesome <laughs> film. Loved it. Really, really cleverly shot. Um, I'm not quite sure I would have given it best film. Oscar, but it got it anyway. So, what do yeah, I? Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with I, I don't agree with the best film Oscar um, win. I just think that um, there were much better films released last year, better than um, Birdman, and so like Boyhood. It, yeah, like definitely like Boyhood. Boyhood's an amazing film, but it's still you've got to give Michael Keaton plaudits for playing the character because he is pretty much playing himself in the film it's sort of like you're looking at his career um the where his career went downhill with alcohol and all that kind of stuff but now he's trying to pick it back up and what a film to actually do um especially directed by uh, uh, alessandro gonzalez in a i nearly forgot his name there 
But the, he's a very interesting director. Um, he did a film called Amoros Perros, which I wasn't a fan of, because there's a segment in that movie which I hated. It involves um, dogfighting, and I don't like that kind of stuff. But he's a very interesting director who has an interesting tact on handling very complex films. And in this movie, he just the complex part of the film is the way the camera flows through each one of the scenes. And so the camera feels like a character in itself. And I love when directors do that. So it's got some really good acting in it, some really good character feeding off each other. Because Edward Norton is, is really good in the movie as well, and so is Emma Stone. And so nobody plays uh, bad in the film itself. I just think Boyhood was a better film. At number two, a film which I wish was a better film, uh, Ridley Scott's directed Exodus, Gods and Kings. So is that an think? indication of what you thought of the film? It is. I'm a massive fan of Ridley Scott. I've got a signed poster from the dude. I've got a signed Blade Runner poster here and whatnot. So I'm a big fan of his. I've seen all his films. But I can't be bothered watching Exodus, Gods and Kings. I don't know why. I think I can't remember the last really, really good Ridley Scott film. I would have to look at his filmography and go, oh, yeah, that was it. But it was probably quite a few years ago. Probably American yeah. Gangster or something like that. I sort of agree with you because uh, Prometheus... It's got some interesting elements to it, but this one is, is just bad. It, it's just, uh, as I described last week when I was reviewing the film, it felt like um, Joel Edgerton, who plays uh, one of the characters in the film, he's very much like Boy George and from the 1980s in Culture Club. And so you're expecting him to burst out with a line of come a chameleon rather than just being attacked by chameleons or frogs or um, fish or something like that. So it's just a really weirdly handled movie. He tells that part of the Bible uh, like for like, like we've seen before. But at least other films directed in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, those big, huge, massive biblical epics, even though they were on for four hours, there was still much more interesting than this CGI ball fest. Exactly. It's a shame. I miss the Ridley Scott with capital letters. Um, yeah. I wish he'd come back. And the, the annoying thing is, though, at the end of the film, he just put on dedicated to Tony Scott. So this is the film that he dedicated to him. Wow. And I uh, really miss Tony Scott as well. Yeah, you know, I'd be rolling around in my grave if this was the film that somebody dedicated to me. I'll be like, can you, can you not like, dedicate Prometheus to me? At least that was entertaining enough. Can you just dedicate the next one? Your Monopoly yeah. movie or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Or Kaplunk. <laughs> Do the exactly. Kaplunk movie so you can dedicate that to me. At least we enjoyed playing that. Exactly. Yeah, poor old Ridley. I miss him. And number one, we have a film that you know, somebody would have said 10 years ago that I probably wouldn't bother watching it. I'd be like, well, get out of it, I'll watch it. But I haven't. The Hobbit, Battle of the Five Armies. Yeah, um, to sum up the trilogy of uh, the Hobbit films, this is... Oh, is it over yet? Because that, that, that's how you... Yeah, that, that's how you feel. Because when you're watching the film, you're just going, just please... Uh, has it got something to do with the ring again? And are you throwing it in Mount Doom again? And... Is Sauron there, or Saruman, or somebody like that? Are we going to see it's Gandalf? There's a lot lots of walking in it again. We've got another three hours of just people walking up hills, possibly. No, it's just a lot of CGI, or just too much CGI. A lot, because that, that's the thing about uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and I don't know if you agree with me on this, but the thing I loved about the Lord of the Rings trilogy is the amount of extras he used to add human elements to it. So all of these orcs and urukais were people in costume. Yeah, you had a lot of digital of it, but a lot of it were people in costume in makeup. Yet in the Hobbit trilogy, it's a lot of CGI. I know there is no reason why a film that is 14 years old, yes, Fellowship of the Ring, should look better than a film that just came out last year, Battle of the Five Armies. Generally, the older the film, the worse it should look. But CGI technology is just making films look really, really shoddy and dating them really, really fast. 
Yeah, that that's the worst thing. In about ten years' time, when you decide to go, I think I might sit down and watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy and then watch the Hobbit trilogy after it. You're going to be disgusted about how bad the CGI is in the Hobbit trilogy compared to you at a guest at how brilliant the the practical effects are in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's the same with the Star Wars trilogy. You go back and watch the original trilogy and then watch the prequels. The prequels look terrible compared to the old films. Yeah. It makes no sense. It's, it's, it's like when you watch a movie from the 80s. You still, you, you still absolutely love the way practical effects are handled. The Thing, for example, and um, just anything from the 80s, even if you look at Gremlins, seeing a character there um, in Gizmo, it just adds something to the film. Yet when you watch a movie from the late 90s coming into the, the, the 2000s, like an Avatar or something like that, you just look at it and think, God, that CGI is worse than I expected. Yep. I think, for me, the biggest culprit of that is Roland Emmerich. So if you look at um, Independence Day in 2012, Independence Day has not aged well at all. It looks I, I saw bits of it about two weeks ago. And it is definitely not aged at all. Yet I can sit and watch like 10 80s films and just look at it and go, Christ, that is fantastic the way they handled that. Yeah. I'll not be able to do that with these CGI movies. CGI needs to just go away. It won't because it's cheaper to do. But Bring back practical Eh. effects. Exactly. Well, hopefully, Star Wars will do really well because JJ does claim he's used more practical than anything else. So we shall see. We shall hope. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Home releases. Um, the first one up is The Theory of Everything, directed by James Marsh. And as we alluded to, it tells the story of Stephen Hawken. In this um, film, it's played by Eddie Redmayne, um, winner, award winning. Eddie, Eddie Redmayne, alongside uh, Felicity Jones, who um, there's a clip I'm just going to quickly set up. He, the, um, Stephen, he's gone to college and he's not sure about what he wants to do because you see at the start of the film he's very troubled and deciding on what he wants to do and then all of a sudden he stumbles on a theory. It's the theory practically of everything. It's the name of the film. It's how humans became, how the Big Bang happened. And in this clip, it just it's just about him explaining to the uh, Felicity Jones's character about the kind of ideas that he's coming up with. If Einstein is right, right if general relativity is correct, then yes. the universe is expanding, yes? Yes. Okay, so if you reverse time, then the universe is getting smaller. All right. So, what if I reverse the process all the way back to see what happened at the beginning of time itself? At the beginning of time itself? Yes. So the universe getting smaller and smaller, getting denser and denser, hotter and hotter. Well, you as mean we have... wind back the clock? Yeah, exactly, wind back the clock. Wind back the clock. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> you're winding back the clock? That is what I'm doing. <laughs> well, keep winding. I know. And you've got quite a long way to go. Keep winding. I don't want to fall in. Well, you've got to go back to the beginning of time. You've got a long way to go. Well, keep winding. Keep winding. Until you get... A singularity. A space-time singularity. So the universe born from a black hole exploding. Keep going. What do you mean, keep going? What? Before the universe began. No, 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 no. Keep going, develop the mathematics. And so that sort of, like, starts to cement the relationship between uh, Jane and Stephen. And however, um, something bad happens to Stephen. He ends up getting a thing called uh, motor neuron disease, which sort of, like, eats away at the body. It it stops you from being able to be yourself. Um, And so during the film, it's about Stephen coming to terms with that and his wife coming to terms with that. And trying to live a normal life while also coming up with this theory about um, how the universe began, about how humans began and coming up with the mathematics. And it is a troubling film from that point of view because it is really hard for him to do that. And also him having a normal life, having children, having a wife, trying to, his wife staying with him during the, um, throughout his, his life and 
that's what's so fantastic about the film. It, it is all about the character. Unlike with movies like Hitchcock, where it just centered around one movie that Alfred Hitchcock created instead of his life story, this one properly centers around Stephen Hawking's life. And it's brilliantly portrayed by Eddie Redmayne. He, he, um, he is unbelievably, he looks a lot like Stephen Hawking. And if you listen to a lot of interviews with, um, with him, he wanted to, he concentrated months on end about the contortions of his hands and the movement of his body. And he spoke to um, Stephen a few times about how to get his mannerisms about because Stephen Hawkins is not only an intelligent person, a very intelligent person, that very is an understatement, a stupidly, insanely um, intelligent person. He's a very down-to-earth person as well. He's willing to do a joke. He's willing to appear on things like the Big Bang Theory or take the mickey out of one direction. So at least he never gets it down. And I think Eddie Redmayne portrays that brilliantly. You do see the turmoil in his life where a lot of it is getting to him and also a lot of it is getting to his wife who's fantastically portrayed by Felicity Jones. And so you do see that as well. So it's practically a what and all. You're not going to get all the best bits of his life and you're not going to get all the worst bits of his life. You're going to get an amalgamation of both and it's handled fantastically. That It's got nice humour running through it, but overall it's just definitely worth a watch. Even if you have no interest in mathematics or the creation of the universe or anything like that, who cares? Because that's just an underlying element of the movie. The rest of the film is all about their relationship. And it's a, a really interesting, brilliantly acted, brilliantly portrayed relationship. i got a question for you, though. Is it the subject matter sounds really, really depressing? Because yeah. you, know, you know the outcome of the disease that, uh, that Stephen's got. Is it a depressing film to watch? Or do you come away from it f not feeling like you want to jump off a bridge or whatever? No, it never ever feels like that because that's not what Stephen Hawking's life was like. He was never one of, at the start of the film, he's sort of like, when he finds out that he's got motor neuron disease, he is that kind of person who walls himself off from people. But the more his relationship goes on with Jean, the more he becomes more open again and becomes himself again. And so if you look at Stephen Hawking now, and if, if you listen to interviews with Stephen Hawking, he never gets it, lets it bogged down because people who suffer from this disease, they don't have a very long life expectancy. They don't at all. It's not a very, it's a very short amount of time. And he's, he's just surprised a lot of doctors by lasting the amount of time that he has lasted. And the world will seriously be an empty place without him in because he is, he, like I said, he's not just the world's most intelligent person. He is one of the most down-to-earth people you ever going to hear on interviews. So you can see that it has never gotten to him now. So it's not a depressing movie at all. It's an uplifting film with some humour and it has the down part to it. But that's what's uh, the underlying word you need to listen to in that review there is uplifting. It's a proper uplifting film. Okay, I shall give it a go. Yep, I didn't want to watch two sort of powerful uh, films today so i opted to watch one and then watch something daft afterwards yeah um so you've got a review haven't you i have now this film i actually watched probably about two months ago courtesy of high flyers so thank you very much for that one what i love about getting the odd screener disc now and again is that they just come with a title on it so half the time you don't even know who's in it what a film's about or even what genre it is one of these films was playing it cool i popped it in and it's one of those rare gems that's actually a romantic comedy that has comedy in it a lot of the times rom-coms are just rom and there's very little comedy in it. They're just sort of sugary, quoted type things. But this one actually did make me laugh because it had some adult humor in it. Chris Evans plays a guy who we never find out what his name is. He's just called Narrator. Now, he writes screenplays for a living and he gets uh, sort of asked to write this, this movie about romantic comedy. He gets asked to write one, but he's a non-committal guy. So he doesn't know the first thing about relationships. So he starts to do a little bit of research. He starts going out a little bit more at night. And this is when he bumps into Michelle Monaghan. We don't know what her name is either. So they just call her, her. She's attached to somebody else. And then the film ventures into the when Harry met Sally sort of territory. Can a boy be friends with a girl without falling in love with each other? 
and that's where the film carries on. You got a really good supporting cast. You got Anthony Mackie, who I've seen flying around in uh, in Captain America, and Topher Grace is in there as well. So it was nice. So don't be put off by the fact that it's a rom com because there is actually quite a bit of com in it. So yeah, I would actually recommend playing it cool. It was uh, it's one of my gems of the year. Surprising, because um, there's a film that I reviewed about a month ago called Two Night Stand, which is a, another romantic comedy, which um, has the rom part of it, but also has the com part of it, because it has got the, I would say one of the mans at the moment, the actor of the moment, Miles Teller in it. And it's just about a simple story about two people who get locked inside of a flat when a, a storm has happened on the outside, and them trying to come to terms with that happened in, in the one night stand that they had, which ultimately becomes a two night stand. And so... By the sounds of things, this is similar to that. It's got the nice humour there to it as well, because, like you said, that's the annoying part about these romantic comedies. They either have the rom and very little of the com. Yeah, but this one did. I mean, it didn't feel like it was a PG. So, you know, there was a little bit of bad language in there and stuff, which was a refreshing change for a rom-com. So it was sort of film that adults could watch and have a chuckle but uh and it was nice to see chris evans not chucking the shield around and playing something different than we've seen him play over the past few years with the uh, with american moves and there's so yeah there you go back to you Steve. Steve. yeah uh, looking at the cast he's got he does got... Hey, uh, nope. i thought he'd wonder this no is... <laughs> no, this is the brilliant about live, uh, doing stuff live. But yeah, I'm just looking at the cast. Chris Evans, Michelle Monaghan, Yoan Griffith, Andy McKay, Aubrey Plaza, Martin Starr, Ashley Tisdale, uh, Patrick Warburton, Luke Wilson, Topher Grace, Matthew yep. Morrison. So it's got a big, huge cast for a... It has. Um, and did this get a cinema release? Um, I don't believe so. I mean, it's one of these that probably went under a different title. Let's just have a look at that one. Nope, it's called Playing Your Call. came out in 2014. Um, well, that's when it was made. Came out of the cinema May fifteenth over here. Um, yeah, May two thousand fifteenth. But it's actually out on DVD, so it got a very, very short cinema release. If in fact it did show on big screens. So it's got a huge, massive cast like that. Um, direct to DVD. Interesting. Yep. Crazy. I'm guessing they're they're probably just reeled in a lot of um, favors because uh, he said. Uh, you're in um, Avengers with me. Why don't you just come in this film with me as well? I think they did, but the it was, you know, these roles were quite meaty roles. They weren't sort of just blink, can you miss some cameos like Robert Downey and Chef or whatever. You know, they were in it for quite a while. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was a well made thing, so who knows? Yeah, uh, who knows anyway. Now, onto the yep. smaller films of the week. Um, I'm going to skip. I was going to do We Are Monsters last and Wormwood uh, next, but I'm going to actually do We Are Monsters next because uh, I like to sort of like keep a bargain basement movie to be the last one. So Wormwood is going to be the the the, the final film of the week. Um, so we'll have a look at We Are Monsters. It's a British film. It's directed by Anthony Petru and it stars LaShawn Alexandra. And um, it centers around uh, his character in a, he plays Robert Stewart or Stewart in the film. Which annoyed me, considering the character that he is. It's just, I, I hate it when somebody has your name and they're the, the kind of character like he is in the film. Um, he's to be, to be fair, it's spelt different, though. So we get away with yeah. it. We're both S-T-U-A-R-T's. So. Yes, yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's just, but it's still really, really bad. But um, it just centers around him being put into prison. He looks at, at the start of the film, he just looks like a very normal normal guy even though he's got a cross on his forehead you think he might have a few little screws loose here and there but <laughs> i don't see anything wrong with him he's not seen anything at the when he's actually brought into the prison whether to see his name or anything he's not seeing at all he keeps himself dumb he gets put into the the cell with um, a character called Z zahid um and again when zahid's trying to to get a conversation with him He's just not answering. It's so sort of like you might think, oh, he's going to keep himself to himself. But right at the start of the film, it's that annoying thing that they use where you see the ending. And so the, the film plays out leading up to the ending where it unfolds 
um, Stuart's character, and you do find out exactly the monster as the title. Because he is a, a bit of a monster. I'm not going to go into depth of, on what he is because that sort of like destroys the purpose of watching the film. But he is, uh, you see his past about what happens, what's happened with his family and all of this kind of thing. And all the way through the movie, he has this, the devil, the, the devil side of him constantly berating him and constantly just telling him to do things and being the the nasty person that he is um and so what did you think of the film first i knew very little about it before i watched it which is usually the way i like to watch films nowadays i knew it was a british one i knew it was set around the youth offenders i also knew it was a true story which gives this sort of film a whole nother impact when you watch it um i i I was blown away by it, to be honest. I thought Lee Sean Alexander, who plays Robert Stewart, he actually wrote the film as well. He wrote the screenplay, which I found out, which is just crazy. The uh, the director, Anthony Patrol, he just retweeted my review about 30 seconds ago on Twitter. My little iPod lit up, so he's obviously just read my review of it. I really, really liked it. It was a tough film to watch. There's a lot of harsh language, really, really harsh language and dialogue in that one. There's a lot of uncomfortable scenes, but that's the whole point this sort of film you need to not enjoy watching it but i think it's a film that everybody should watch just don't put it on in front of kids at all because it's yeah, harsh it's a movie um which reminded me a lot of a cross between american history x and start up yeah i so actually it, put it, in my review in little banners i put british history x actually i put that line in there so yeah it is it's very reminiscent of the uh, of the edward norton film yeah, it, it tries to be a lot like um, the grittiness of Startup, which it never reaches that level at all because I think Startup is a much more superior film. And it tries to get to sort of like the racism of um, American History X and again, sort of like the grittiness of that uh, film. And again, it reaches nowhere near that level because American History X is one of my favourite films. I adore that movie. It's a really difficult film to watch, but it, it's such a rewarding film. I, I mean, with, problems... Amer with American History X, though, did you not find that you had sympathy for Edward Norton at some point? You kind of liked him because he's Edward Norton. I had no sympathy for Robert Stewart in this film whatsoever. I mean, you saw some of the flashbacks and you're like, poor kid. But then when you saw the way that he was talking to people when he was more of an adult, zero sympathy. So I found it a lot grittier than American History X, which See, I also I... love as well. It's one of my favorite films. I, I don't agree with that because the fact that I think um, Edward Norton's character in American History X is you look at the, his uh, child life in that film and then he tries his best to reform himself. But it's really difficult because his brother is copycatting him. So the grittiness is there. But you've also got the reformed character in Edward Norton's character in it. So Edward Furlong is, I think that's the best role he's ever done in American History X. And I also maybe... He's, I would have to say that's the best Edward Norton's ever done as well, acting-wise, in that, in that film. And so it, it's sort of like you've got the best of both worlds in, in American History X. In this one, you've only just got minor times where you do feel sorry for his character, yet the rest of it you feel repulsed by his character. So it's not, it, it doesn't have very much grittiness because the fact that it is just a constant wave of racism from him, it got on my nerves a bit. That, to be honest, because it is just a constant, it constantly drops the N-word a lot, and I mean a lot, Does, for a 15-rated yeah, yeah, film. Yeah. This this is a, just the, a, the high, high end of 15. It's not like the last time I remember watching a film where I couldn't believe it was a 15-rated film was um, Safe Park, Big, Long, Run, Uncut. Because that film has got the most swear words ever in an animated film, and the most swear words in a 15-rated film. This, I think, should have been rated 18 because it it's sort of like on the level of startup in its nastiness. The reason this, this one, one, though, the reason... Yeah, but the reason We Are Monster gets a 15 is because it's the true story. It's more of an educational film. It's a film that 15-year-old should definitely would have gone eating. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think the the BPFC should look at from that. I don't care if it's based on a true story or not. Um, it's a film that should have easily been rated 18, not 15. 
Um, you, you can have movies that's based on a true story that's rated 18. You can have movies, I don't care the age certificate of it, just because you should give it a, a an easier path because it's based on a true story. I don't agree with that. Um, no, but it, I think you should give it an easier path. year old should watch this film. I think by making an 18, you're ruling out the sort of should actually watch this film so they don't go down the same path as Robert Stewart, who was probably less than 18 years old when he was actually, you know, when that character was doing what he did. I don't even think that you should show this to 15s. Because I, th I, think that, I think it's just too graphic in its nature to show to 15s. I know that the, a lot of them do spout these words to yeah. friends but um yeah i think i personally think that the film should be rated 18 but this is that's a whole different tact um it's just i'm not as enamored with the movie as much as you were i thought i thought the film had problems but uh yeah i think you liked the film much better than me final dvd and um unfortunately the reason why we've got little gaps in yeah. here there is what there would is be your, your top couple of problems oh sorry Sorry, it's just that yeah, we're having a few technical problems. The typical Skype thing. So uh, if the show is a bit if, wobbly at times, it's it's Skype. Just blame no. Skype. No. So I will just quickly go on to Wormwood. Um, Wormwood is an Australian zombie film. It's directed by Kai Roach Turner. It's a very simple film in a way. It centers around the character of Barry, who's played by Jay Gallagher. Um, he's it's part of a zombie apocalypse, but you don't know how this zombie apocalypse happened. Um, his sister is kidnapped, who's played by Bianca Brady, who plays Brooke. And so he sets out to try and hunt down his sister. However, his sister discovers that she's got these powers that's able to control zombies. And she has to try and save herself from this absolutely insane mad scientist who's trapped her inside this moving truck and experimenting on these zombies. Now, I'm I'm a big fan of these brain dead movies. These these movies where you just sit back and relax and just enjoy the ninety minutes that's about to happen. I didn't enjoy the ninety minutes that's happening in this film because the gore there is a lot of it. It's just the film is just too nuts to to get any grasp to it. It, it makes no sense. It has no proper structure to it at all. Um, there is no proper character development. It just decides to introduce this element where uh, the character of Brooke has these powers where she can manipulate zombies and get them to do her bidding. Just to add a we really strange, weird element to the film. And so that doesn't work. The gore stuff does work because it's nice to see a horror film, but... Um, with lots of gore in it, but the rest of the film doesn't. Using zombies also for fuel is an interesting element, and there is one scene where she does lead a zombie into um, the back of the car, and the way they actually use zombies for fuel is not to grind up the zombies, they actually practically get the zombies to burp into this tank, and so it's the gas from the zombies which don't, doesn't work during the day, and so, yeah, it's just weird. It's a weird film, which... Which is decent on the go, but nothing else. Unleaded Completely zombies. Oh. Yeah. Unleaded petrol zombies. Sir. Yeah, exactly. That's the kind of uh, fuel that we're not looking forward to in the future. Nope. Is it? Because that means we're <laughs> going to have to have a zombie apocalypse for cars to run. And so you can just imagine what firms and companies will think will be a good idea. Let's genetically engineer zombies. Zombies aren't good. Right. That's it for this week's show. Um, sorry, like I've just said there about the technical problems. It's Skype. Skype doesn't like us. It, when us two get together anyway, it doesn't like us. No, nope. Skype doesn't like anybody. No, it's Microsoft. They, I think they're they're about ready to push out Windows 10, so they're just going, we're not going to bother with any other Windows, and it's going to work badly. So um, I, I've got a couple of TV movies of the week uh, just to go through. Um, the first one is on Film 4 on Saturday the 16th. Now, I'm hoping this is a film you've seen. I think you have seen it. The Raid. Oh, many times. Yeah, good film. Wonderful yeah, film. And what, yeah, it's a very, very violent film. Very violent film. Brilliantly choreographed. The, the fight scenes in it are very much more like ballet 
rather than fight scenes because it's just exquisitely choreographed from um, a Welsh director as well and Gareth Evans. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's a fantastic film. I'm film for on this, uh, Saturday the 16th at 11.20. And um, I'm hoping you agree with this one as well. My other uh, choice is on the Horror Channel, because you can now get the Horror Channel on Freeview, which is a good thing. It's on Thursday the 14th at 9 o'clock. It's directed by Eduardo Sanchez. Lovely Molly. Still haven't seen it. It's sitting about three feet away from it in the DVD shelf. So I do have it. I will get round to watching it at some point. But my pile of shame is just insanely huge. It's like that mountain out of Close Encounters. But uh, I've heard you say really, really good things about Lovely Molly on many occasions, which is why I picked the film up. And I'm a fan of the Blair Witch Project. So Yeah, I, I really, really liked um, Lovely Molly. Um Eduardo Sanchez did a did a Bigfoot movie called Exists, but I I think that's a good film. I think he's a good director, Eduardo Sanchez, and I'm I'm guessing he's not one of these directors who wants the um from the director of the Blair Witch Project constantly following for the rest of his life. Even though it's a, it's a nice thing to have, that would slightly annoy me. But um, with Lovely Molly, he went away from that so like found footage kind of thing and did this movie a very very. L- Pulled back film. It, it's just centers around a couple of characters. It's, it's a smaller film in a weird. It sounds weird that when you look at them, um, when you look at the Blair Witch Project, because that's just about three characters. This is just about a couple of characters, but it, it it's brilliantly well handled. It's very very creepy, as well. So I highly recommend Lovely Molly, which is again it's on Horror Channel on Thursday the fourteenth at nine o'clock. That's if you listen to us live. If you listen to podcasts, then it's probably already been on. And the Horror Channel, anyway, they'll probably repeat it. They will do. In between Doctor Who episodes and Star Trek Next Generation episodes. Yep. And uh, Xena Warrior Princess and maybe Hercules as well. Yeah. And Tales from the Dark Side. But the Horror Channel is actually a really good channel. And I'm glad that it's on Freeview now. Number 70. So anybody trying to find Horror Channel, it's on number 70 on Freeview. Yeah, and if you've got Sky, it's 319. Just to add that there. There you go. Uh, Yep, so that's it for this week's show. Um, thank you very much, Stuart, for joining me. Thank you very much, Stuart, for having me. Yeah, uh, hmm, quite cheesy that, wasn't it? Um, filling, in Andrew's, filling in Andrew's boots um, for this week's show. I don't, I'm not sure if Andrew will be back for next week's show. I've spoke to him today. Um, he's unsure himself, so there might be a chance that, Stuart, you might be joining me for a second week in a row. If wow, so, sorry. I will give you... Sorry, listeners. Yep. Yeah, I will give you much more of a, a notice towards that. Gives you a better chance to watch um, a few more films, just in case. Because um, I don't know if you're interested in seeing Pitch Perfect two. Uh, I wasn't really interested in watching Pitch Perfect one. Or Mad what Max Fury Road. Mad Max. Oh come on! The some of the Cineworld world um, places are doing double bills of Mad Max one and two. Um, Fraser from that. Cops and Monsters is off to watch that. And he was told by his friend not to watch Mad Max 3 because it was terrible. I'm like, how dare you? Get it watched. Yeah. Why not? You might oh, as well awesome. watch the trilogy before you go see Mad Max Fury Road. And um, from early indications from what I've been hearing, it's very good. Yeah, people are coming so... in there with their eyes red because it's just sensory overload, which is exactly I... what you want from that. How do you think I feel? I'm going to be reviewing our next week's show and um, hopefully I'll have seen Pitch Perfect 2 as well. I'm going to play you out with a clip of Mad Max Fury Road as well, but I'm going to see it in 3D. So I'm going Ouch. to have bleeding eyes and bleeding ears. You will. Good luck. But um, yeah, a couple of shout outs before I disappear. Um, I'm at Cryptic Tadpole on Twitter. You're at From Page, the number two screen on Twitter. Yep. And you've also got your brilliant, brilliant website from Page2Screen.com which yep. we mention every week on the show, and you've also had ad, ad an advert as well played out. So you've got a lot of shout-outs. So uh, at, at least that's been a positive of you turning up on tonight's show, then lots of publicity, which is always a nice thing, isn't it? And it's um, my birthday next week on the 18th of May, and on exactly the same day, I'm launching a really, really low-targeted Indiegogo fundraiser. So, yeah, you know, instead of birthday cards, it's chucked me the price of a coffee in, so there you go. Um, and just yeah. to make it just to make it more interesting, if you are joining me on next week's show, that show goes out live on the eighteenth of May. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that that would be an interesting one if that's the case. So it you will. can kick start off your your um your fundraising thing then. So you can release it live then if you wanted to. It I would couldn't be need to do that. Do it. 
So, so Andy, uh, it, it, Andy, have a week off. Don't worry about it. Just yeah. even, if Andy, even if Andrew's doing the show, we'll just get you one, just do a little thing like that and kick you off, which is a nice That's thing good. to do, but... Deal. Uh, yeah, you can also uh, get a, my website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk, um, on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash mondaymovieshow, or you can email us, mondaymovieshow at yahoo.com. Uh, make sure you check out Following the Nerd, followingthenerd.com, fantastic website. Um, I'm part of their show on a Thursday night. I do the box office top 10. And also, I, I'm going to give a shout out to his YouTube channel. You need to watch a video on there and help him out as much as possible. But uh, Saxon, who works on followingthenerd.com, he has a YouTube channel called Vote Saxon 07. Now, his latest video, I implore you to watch it. And if you can help him out in any way, shape or form, please do. Because what he does is brilliant. So just watch that video. He has no notice of me. I am saying that tonight, but please watch that video. And like I said, if you can't help them out, that will just be an absolute joy because we now I'll, no longer have it. I, I will. I'll share that video if you can tell me why they call him Saxon. Because every week at the beginning they say he's called this, but everybody knows him as Saxon. Where does the Saxon come from? I don't know. Oh, oh well, I'll have to find it out. But yeah, I I'll share the video. Right? I'm sure he's told me in the past, but I can't remember if that's the case. So um, I'll, I'll I'll find out for you if that's uh, for that. But yeah, make sure you check out his YouTube channel because we don't have a charity anymore. So we used to support the Seven Foundation, but the Seven Foundation unfortunately had to close down. So um, check out Vote Saxon 07 on YouTube. You can also find the Monday Movie Show on YouTube as well. But last week's show was taken down off YouTube due to a dispute. Oh, music so, trailers. Yeah, music. So for, yeah. Um, let, let's hope that this week's show that will not be the case. Um, we'll play you out with a clip from a, um, a movie that we are, well, I'll be reviewing anyway on next week's show. I don't have a movie of the week this week because the films that I reviewed were a bit bad, apart from the theory of everything. So just rent that out. And I'm guessing you're picking We Are, we Monster? are Monster. Yes. So I'll have a I double am. bill of that then if that's the case. But it's an interesting double bill <laughs> uh, for that. But yeah, I'll, I'll play you out with a clip from Mad Max Fury Road. And until next week from me, good night. And from Stuart, oh, well, I don't know when you'll see it. You never know, it might be next week. Good night. Bye. How do you know this place even exists? I was born there. So why'd you leave? I didn't. I was taken as a child. Stolen. You'd done this before? Many times. Now that I drive a war rig, this is the best shot I'll ever have. And them? They're looking for hope. What about you? Redemption.